Welcome to Show Me Tech. Today's show is about extended realities with AR and VR. With me today, I have Vitaly Pobarev, founder and CEO of Wayray, and Mark Poliface, professor of computer science at ETH and director of science at Microsoft. To give us all a little bit of an introduction to the topic of extended realities, Jonathan Eisenring, the founder of the Digital Festival, is going to give us his brief. Extended reality brings all three realities, such as VR, AR, and MR, under one roof. Virtual reality is an immersive experience that is simulated by the computer. It refers to using headsets to generate realistic sounds, images, and other sensations. By doing this, a real environment is replaced by an imaginary world that tries to engage all five senses. After years of popularity in the gaming industry, we are now seeing this technology in more practical applications. There are different kinds of headsets, such as the Oculus Go and the Oculus Rift, the Vive headset from HTC or the Gear VR from Samsung. Augmented reality is a live view of a physical, real-world environment, which is supplemented by elements such as graphics, video or sound. Key to AR is that things are indexed to a location. And in many cases, you can interact with those visuals that are augmenting your view. Mobile and tablets are the most popular mediums of AR, as we see in this application from Disney Research. Mixed reality is the merging of a real and virtual world to produce new environments, as we see here with the example of the new Microsoft HoloLens 2. The key element of mixed reality is that physical and digital objects not only coexist, but also interact in real time. Until recently, most of the devices have been quite cumbersome and always connected to a game console or a high-performance PC. But since tethering is a no-go for adopting technology in daily life, recent products build the electronics into the devices themselves or in a small companion processor, like in the example of the new Magic Leap 1. As we saw in the video, there are various different use cases from education, real estate, design, engineering, entertainment to healthcare. By being home to high potential startups such as MyMazy or Wayray, or well-known companies such as Oculus, Magic Leap, Disney and Microsoft, Switzerland can be understood as one of the top hotspots for extended reality. A great example of the so-called immersive reality is shown here in the video of the Atelier de Lumière in Paris. An exhibition of Van Gogh's art pieces are shown as a combination of art and music merging into an immersive experience for the audience by making use of more than 140 projectors. Extended reality is definitely one of the hottest technologies these days. Keep in mind it's something that you have to experience in order to fully understand. But don't worry though, it is still the early days and there is still enough time to experience these technologies before they become omnipresent in our everyday life. So we like to start off our chat with something that we call the choice. Behind me here, you will see two images and you will see a question for each one and you choose which one you would prefer. So I wanna start off with this question. Which do you choose, HoloLens or HTC Vive? It's a tough choice, I know for some of you, a very tough choice, but uh, Mark, which would you choose? I choose the new version of HoloLens. Very good, very good, and why? Uh, I'm much more interested in, in augmented reality. Uh, so in particular, I'm interested in being in the real world, being able to see the real world, but then get information or extra information to help me do stuff in the real world. Uh -huh. And what about you? Um, I'm not that biased as Mark. So I will choose uh, HoloLens as well, but for another reason, because I truly believe that augmented reality has uh, a lot of opportunities more than uh, virtual reality. Perfect. So the next question I want to jump into is more about you as a person. So. Which one do you prefer? Are you the sailor or are you the skydiver? Vitaly? Um, probably I'm skydiver. Yeah. Skydiver, you ever done skydiving? Uh, did once. Only. Did you like it? Yeah, I liked it I a lot. So. It's cool. scary, but yeah, cool. it's a lot of fun. <laughs> what about you? I think I'm more of a sailor. More of a sailor? Yeah. I feel you just sail the waves, smooth sailing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. White water? <laughs> <laughs> Kayaking or stuff, yeah. Nice. Cool. And then we're going to jump into our last question that I have for you today. That's more about inspiration. So out of these two people here, Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs, who inspires you most? I know they're both very inspirational people, but who inspires you most out of the two of those? Maybe you want to start with this one? Uh, I, I think I'd take Steve, Steve Jobs. Yeah. Uh, I think he's really created uh, some really nice stuff. Uh, I think uh, the other one, we're still, uh, there's good and bad, I would say. Good and bad, uh -huh. 
<laughs> what about yeah, you? Yeah, it's a very controversial choice. I would choose Steve Jobs as well. Uh -huh. uh, but because with he, he just created a new platform and I like that uh, he created a kind of uh, platform style uh, startup. So I think from, from Apple, the platformization was a, was a new term and I think that Apple has created a, uh -huh. a great ecosystem because of that. I agree with that. I love the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So jumping in right from there, you know, I want to start off with a personal question. What was your favorite subject in school? Uh, probably math. Math? Physics. Physics. Oh, wow. That's uh, closely related, I guess, in that regard. <laughs> and then my favorite question that I just love to ask, because I think that's interesting, what are you passionate about? So this could be anything. It could be anything from related to cooking, related to what you do. Like, what are you passionate about? It's Sunday morning. You get up. You can do whatever you want to do. What do you do? Sunday morning, I work. This is my passion. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah let's say besides, uh, besides working, maybe uh, reading some comics. Uh, cool. In Belgium, it's quite popular. Yeah. What's your favorite comic? Uh, it's difficult to say. Like, uh, as a kid, definitely Tintin. Uh, still Tintin. like it. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I want to jump into the topic that we are here to talk about. And I want to start off with a question of just where do you see the most promising uses of, of AR on the one side and, and VR on the other side? So maybe kick off the discussion with that. Uh, Mark? I think, I think AR is in general, wherever you, know, you need to, you want to do a task, you want to do something in the real world, which could be navigation, but it could also be many other things. Um, as soon as you have to do something that's non-trivial, that's complicated, you need extra information to help you do it. That's, I think, where AR can really enable uh, amazing things. Um, I think for VR, um, it's uh, the best use case, I think, are going to be in um, communicating with uh, faraway people. Um, mm -hmm. I think you know, that's why Facebook is excited about it. Um, I think uh, there are also some applications in, in training, although in many cases, AR is just as powerful there uh, for training, I would say. Mm -hmm. Do you have any inputs on that? Where do I you think, see I think that, that AR enables, uh, that we, like we say, that we are AR glass companies, so we are enabling uh, the windows into virtual worlds. So we are merging the real world with the virtual world. That can be also the training, but, but on top of that, that could be any, any information that will help you to navigate. In our case, it's a navigation, advanced driver assistance systems, uh, but also games, uh, anything, any virtual worlds that you can imagine, uh, merged with the real world. That is the main... Uh, the main idea of augmented reality, I think. And, and um, VR is mostly about the virtual worlds only. And um, yes, the training, the, uh, the programs for disabled people, mm -hmm. uh, porn, now it's very famous in, in VR. So all these things and games are, yeah, they, 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 will be, they will find their niche in, in, in VR. In VR in that sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how do you see AR changing the way that we interact with, with the world? I think that to me is where I see one of the biggest advantages. So assuming you, know, you, you get rid of all the hardware problems that we have to deal with, just having the right information at the right place at the right time is kind of what I would understand as like my perfect ideal version of, of, of what AR is. But how do you think that's going to change the way we interact with the world? I mean, you do navigation. That's one of the big things. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's a huge one. I'm a big motorcycle rider, so that's always a huge problem. <laughs> but where do you see that also changing outside of the things we might think of at first glance? Yeah. So the navigation was just the first application for our system. Uh, and for that, I mean, to change the perception of augmented reality in the transportation, we built the SDK, the software development kit for, uh, for developers to develop their applications. So we don't want to invent uh, these ideas. We want third-party developers to develop mm -hmm. some things. And we, we actually don't know what that would be. We just, we just enable that. We just mm -hmm. enable, we create the platform and uh, we will see what they will invent. But I think that the biggest impact, like in the transportation, because we're related to the transportation of AR, would be that uh, it's a new revenue stream for advertisers mm -hmm. and that will impact the cost of the trip because uh, you know that the ride hailing companies like Uber, Didi, uh, they are not very profitable to say because they are fighting, there's a price war between uh, many ride hailing companies uh, all over the world. And I think that another revenue stream for, uh, for ride-hailing companies and for uh, OEMs, the car manufacturers, would be uh, enabled through AR. Mm -hmm. do you, do, have you seen any cases that you think are going to really drastically change the way that we interact with the world? Like, what, where would you like to see it go in that sense? Well, so I think the, the key thing about augmented reality and also mixed reality, as we call it, um, is really about having the information available to you in a 
in a way that um, is very simple and intuitive. Um, for example, in navigation, you have the arrows on the road. You don't have them somewhere on a display that you then have to interpret and you know, essentially spend an effort to see what's on your small screen there, how that relates to the world in front of you. There's something that with augmented reality, with mixed reality, you get just naturally. It's just overlaid on the world. It's where, it, you know, where the information is relevant. It's very low cognitive load uh, for, the, for the users mm -hmm. to do this. Um, I, I know I, I've been talking about some applications, uh, I think that you've also explored in, in uh, where, where people have to make very quick decisions, for example, in speed driving or yeah. so. Mm -hmm. um, they're being able to directly put information in front of the users um, directly on the road means that they can actually absorb the information even in a stressful situation mm -hmm. when, when they have little time to think. It just goes naturally. And I want to talk about skill enablement. Uh, I think that's, that's a part that, that I hear often in this context. You know, can you have the ability to give somebody that's less skilled, I want to say unskilled, but less skilled, um, the chance to do more, right? So in a maintenance context, I think that's something that I, I feel like a lot of people are asking about. Can you use AR to improve things like that? Do you have any cases that you see people using this for absolutely. at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. So, so in our case, um, in two different types of scenarios. So we, we actually have two, two uh, uh, applications that we developed for this, but I think that those are more general. Um, one is enabling remote assistance. So you get someone that has maybe not, is not an expert in a particular mm -hmm. task that's at hand. Uh, for example, because he's on a remote place, he's the best person available, but he doesn't, he's not really the expert for doing a particular task. Um, so he can do the task, but then through a device like HoloLens, through augmented reality, can essentially call in an expert, that expert can essentially look over his shoulder or you know, look through the sensors of, of, of the device and then can place information in front of him and say, this is the button you have to, you know, to press yeah. or this is the thing you have to unscrew and then check this and measure that. Um, and so assist that. And so you get this through augmented reality, through this, this, this possibility to have this remote person bringing information in front of the person, in front of him to help him do the task. So that's one very powerful scenario. Uh, it was one of the first use cases for HoloLens actually, even with, before HoloLens was, uh, in, was uh, available internally, um, where it was being produced. Um, so there was an issue with one of the machines in the production of HoloLens, and they realized that the best way to actually get help was to put on a HoloLens and call in the experts in really? Redmond. For the production of the HoloLens. <laughs> For the production of the HoloLens. <laughs> Talk about uh, a use case, right? Was, Building itself. That's why they yeah. realized the first you know, use yeah. case, and that's what is now one of the apps. It's remote assistance, a uh, remote assist. Another use case, and that's something that we call guides, um, is essentially um, helping people go through a whole procedure by essentially mm -hmm. having a tutorial, like you have tutorial videos or other things. This now brought to mixed reality means that you essentially you're looking at um, a machine that you have to repair or something like this or something you have to assemble. Uh, so for training in a factory or for, let's say for car repair or things like this, you put on the HoloLens and you get essentially step-by-step -step instructions yeah. on how to do this. Uh, this is for more classical scenarios, not for an emergency repair or this or that, but yeah. for like the basic scenarios that you right. have to teach technicians how to do those or how to assemble in a factory a particular you know, piece of hardware. The new person comes on a job, they put on the HoloLens and they get the whole explanation. Um, and they can step by step do it, but in a much easier way than if they have to read it from a manual. Do, do you have any other cases that you really like in that sense? So could be could be related to maintenance, could be related to more what you guys are doing? Like, yeah, yeah actually, um, well, that was my answer. The maintenance was the main case mm -hmm. in wearables. I think that in, in non wearables, and I went into non wearables, um, the main case is that to build a trust between the person and the machine between uh, how, how the machine makes a decision to visualize mm -hmm. the computer vision. So in our case, you know that cars are becoming uh, self-driving uh, over the time. This L5 is coming like somewhere in 2025th. And uh, you need to build a trust, for, especially for people who used to drive. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to release the steering wheel and then trust the machine. So you have to create, you know, the... It's that first moment <laughs> if you're on the test, then you let go and you're like, the wheel starts turning, you feel a little cringy. Yeah, yeah. So, and um, augmented reality helps you to to see how the car makes a decision. So it visualizes the navigation, it visualizes the obstacles it can see, et cetera. So it actually, it, it helps uh, people during the transition period to trust more to the car. And that's kind of also a process of learning. So there is that component in, in AR non-wearables. Where do you see the biggest challenges today? So I think, you know, one challenge I, I've run across a lot in, in the AR field, also in the VR field is, is, is hardware and, you know, where we stand on the development cycle. Uh, but where, where do you guys see the biggest challenges? Like, what's, the, what's, what's keeping this from exploding outwards in adoption rates? Should I? Yeah. 
Uh, well, yeah, hardware, hardware, hardware. <laughs> that is the main challenge, I would say. I mean, software-wise, there are still some, some challenges, but not that big. I would say that people, they, they expect uh, like things that they have seen in, in, in the movies very futuristic and to make that happen you have not only optical challenges but also the real-time rendering uh, mm -hmm. things so you have to you know you want to have it in a slim um, headset and, and that headset, bring, yes. headset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that brings a lot of I mean if, if we talk about uh, the wearables yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got you yes uh, that's why I'm um, a big fan of non-wearables so uh, you have to carry the real-time computing platform you have to carry battery etc etc so it's it's uh, nowadays there are a lot of challenges and that that's why it narrows down the the application of the current uh, existing mm -hmm. wearables in the case of non-wearables you probably have a have some space to put the, the batteries, the uh, uh, the rendering um, engine, etc. So that is that is less challenging from that perspective, but mm -hmm. more challenging from the perspective of optics. Uh, again, to create a, a very big field of view um, that is that is not right now. We are on the edge of of physics, so we are mm -hmm. kind of looking for new materials, developing new lasers. That takes a lot of time, and actually, the industry is not ready for that. So we we create a demand for uh, for the new types of the components, and pioneering that is you know it's not always uh, um, it's it, it's very um, um, capital um, mm -hmm. like intense, intense yeah. yeah. And uh, nobody really wants to be a pioneer in and invest like billions of dollars in something that then uh, will be spread all over the competition. Mm -hmm. So that is also one of the challenges of the industry. Perfect. So to wrap this up, you both know that we love gadgets here at Show Me Tech. So as a little surprise for you guys, you get to choose one gadget over here to take home with you. The only thing you have to do is tell me why you chose what you did. So just choose the first one that comes to mind. Vitaly, which one do you choose? I will choose Super Mario. And why do you choose Super Mario? Well, first, it reminds me of times when uh, computer games were like dozens of kilobytes. Now they're gigabytes. Pixel. Pixel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And they were coding pixels. You know, like yeah. Exactly. That was cool. And um, it will, will make me feel young again. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. What about you? Which do you choose? I think I'll take the, uh, the photo printer. You'll take the photo printer. Wow. That is an excellent choice. That is the most analog thing we have here today. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, the HoloLens team uh, used to be called analog. Uh, exactly because it's about interaction with the real world and intuitive interaction and so on. And so this also, I like, you know, physical real world uh, things. So. Perfect. Well, guys, thank you. Mark, Vitali, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, it was a pleasure to have your insights. And uh, for those of you watching, Vitali will be joining us at Digital Festival 2019. Thank you for watching Show Me Tech. Until next time. Mm -hmm.